First Peter 5, 7, he says, cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Most people, when they read that, they, they get the idea of venting to God in prayer. You know, taking your worries to God in prayer. Taking your pain to God in prayer. Taking your frustrations to God in prayer. And just throwing it on God and then walking away. But that is not the sense in which he is saying, cast all your cares upon him for he cares for you. Because you have to remember, before Peter was a preacher, he was a professional fisherman. He made his money by catching fish. They have this show on the Discovery Channel, Deadliest Catch. Anybody ever seen it, you know? And they go out into the deep, most dangerous parts of the world to catch crabs. And, and they get paid a certain amount of money for every pound of crab that they bring in. Well, they're professional fishermen. Peter was a professional fisherman. So when a fisherman tells you to cast, He's not talking about just throwing something on God, throwing your burden to the Lord, and then walking away. When a fisherman says the word cast, he's talking about throwing your line out there with expectation. He's talking about believing that you're going to pull something back. You don't ever ca A real fisherman don't ever cast and then walk away and start doing something else. A real fisherman is expecting to reel something back to himself after he casts. And what he's telling us is that God has care packages for us. God has a load of care packages for us. But you cannot catch his care unless you cast yours first. Second thing he wants us to know is just that God cares. And I think it's important. God cares. One of the lies the enemy tries to perpetuate on us over and over again is that God doesn't care. Maybe he'll try to make you think, you know, the problem you have is too insignificant or too small. Why would the God of the universe care about that? But God cares. He cares about the problem that you're going through in your home. He cares about the conflict in your relationship. He cares about what you're worried about concerning your children. He cares about your health concerns and health crisis. He cares that your mind's been under attack. He cares. You're not as effective as you could be because you're living with so much stress. He cares about it. And not only does he care, the Greek word for care there isn't just an emotional feeling. It's an action word. It means he wants to take care of it. Now, I want to tell somebody that came in here with just a, a burden of care on your back. God said he wants to take care care of it. Help me spread that around the church. Tell your neighbor, he wants to take care of it. He, he wants to take care of it. Interesting verse that we read, our group of verses that we read in Matthew chapter 17, starting in verse 24. Jesus is at the intersection of his purpose. He's coming right to the crux of the cross. Jesus did not just come to teach and to perform miracles and to heal some people and to do amazing things. Jesus' primary purpose was to die on the cross for the redemption of all of those who would believe in him. So Jesus is walking up and approaching his purpose. And as he gets close to his purpose, the enemy sins an unexpected tax. When you get close to your purpose, you can always know it because the enemy will send an unexpected tax, a taxing situation, a taxing trial, a taxing issue to your life, a taxing issue to your family, a taxing issue to your finances. You get in the car ready to go to work. It's a big day at work. You turn the key and your car won't start. It's a taxing problem. You come home after working all week. You're really hungry and you open the refrigerator and the refrigerators went out and you, all your food is spoiled. Just a taxing issue, a bill you weren't expecting, something you weren't wanting to deal with at a time like this, a taxing season. 
So Jesus is approaching the cross, trying to set his focus on it, and it's important. Jesus has got to do all of these things right because humanity hangs in the balance. Our eternity hangs in the balance. And when he's trying to set his face and his focus towards Jerusalem to do what he's got to do, here comes the enemy with attacks. Now what had happened, Rome had sieged Jerusalem. So the nation of Rome was governing, ruling by force the nation of Israel. And so Caesar of Rome imposed a tax on the nation of Israel. Not only did they have to pay their own national tax as a government, but now they got to pay an extra tax to Rome. You get the idea. So there was no separation of church and state at the time. So the people who ruled and ran the temple and all of the churches... They ruled and ran the state and the politics. So what the Pharisees and Sadducees, the ruler of the temple, what they decided to do was they said, hey, our wallets are getting a lot lighter paying these double taxes. I tell you what we'll do. We'll go to all the members of the church, all the members of the temple, and we'll tax them a temple tax. Saying you can't come to the church Unless you pay the temple tax. They weren't challenging the people to give to the church. They were charging the people at the door. You can't come into the church unless you pay the tax. You going to charge me to come to church? Some churches do it. Every church that charges for a conference is making you pay a temple tax. Every church that tries to sell you merchandise is making you pay a temple tax. Every every church that puts strings on all of their VBS stuff and children's programs charging you a temple tax. Somebody asked me the other day when they heard about us doing Parents Not Out, they said, how much do you charge everybody? I said, nothing. Everything we do is completely free. Now, now, we're big, big on challenging. God's word tells us to challenge. But one thing the church is never supposed to do is charge. You're going to charge me to come into the house of God and worship and tell me if I can't pay at the door that I can't come in? They're charging, and the charge was so egregious. They had gotten the temple tax from all of the church members and temple members except Peter and Jesus. So the tax collectors tracked down Jesus. Do you get the irony of this? The temple and the church was all about God. Jesus is God. But they're knocking on his door. They're trying to tax God over his own house. So they come and they knock on the door and they, they, they say to Peter, the only people that hadn't paid yet is Peter and Jesus. They said, uh, does your teacher not pay the temple tax? And Peter, you know, scared. You know how you get when the IRS calls you. Just scared to death. Said, uh, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, we, we pay. What do we owe? And uh, when, when he comes to the house, he, he's going to go ask Jesus, you know, to open up the treasury and, and, and get the money and then, then pay the temple tax. So you don't want no problems with the IRS. And uh, Jesus anticipated him saying, what do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth take customs or taxes? Do they take them from their sons or from strangers? And he said, uh, well, they, they, take them, they take them from strangers. He said, then the sons are free. Now, any time the enemy brings an unauthorized tax in your life, you got to know the difference between your position 
and your condition. Your position is you're a child of God. If you have accepted Jesus Christ into your heart, if his word is the law which you subscribe to and bow your knee to, then you have been born again out of the world system and into the kingdom of God. And your position is, I am a child of of God. Now your conditions may fluctuate. You may be holy on Monday and be living like the world on a Friday, but your conditions never change the fact that your position is, I am a son of God. To illustrate this point, the prodigal son was his father's son when he was obeying his daddy and living in the house. He was his father's son when he was doing everything daddy told him to do and doing all of his chores. But he was still his father's son when he took his inheritance, left to a far country, got into riotous living, and was living in the pig pen with the hogs. How do I know he was still a son? Because he came to himself in the pig pen and said, in my my father's house there's bread plenty to spare and he arose and he went back to his father because no matter what happened in his conditions his position was I am a child of God I know who my daddy is your condition may change your position is fixed in him you are a child of god so when you get close to your purpose and the enemy starts sending taxing situations taxing problems taxing people trying to extract something from you that you don't want to pay nobody nobody likes paying taxes y'all got quiet on that Nobody likes taxing seasons. Why? Because there's a collector that goes with it. Beating on the door, demanding that you give something that you don't want to give. But Jesus said, Peter, I'm the king of the earth. You didn't hear what I said. He said, I'm the king of the earth. Who do the kings of the earth tax? Do they walk into their children's bedrooms and tax their babies? I mean, I decided to give you life and all and bring you into this world, but I'm going to need you to put that bottle and that rattle down and get out there and work and bring me some tax money. No. The kings don't tax their children. They tax the strangers. Jesus said the sons are free. The Greek word is elotheros. It means exempt. Totally free from the requirement of paying unauthorized taxes. And what's sad about the text is that the reason the Pharisees and Sadducees were only talking to Jesus and Peter, it means that the other 11 disciples had already paid the unauthorized tax. And I just want to tell you, because I feel it in my spirit, you need to stop paying taxes that you're exempt from. You need to stop paying unlawful taxes because you are a child of God. You, it makes me want to find every unauthorized tax in my life and tell the devil, I'm exempt from that. You can't tax my family. I'm exempt from that. You can't tax my finances. I'm exempt from that. You can't tax my marriage. I'm exempt from that. You can't tax my children. I am exempt from that. The children are exempt. Tell your neighbor, the children are exempt. But then Jesus says, verse 27, and I'll tell you why he said this. He said, nevertheless, lest we offend them. The reason why he said this was Peter already agreed to pay it out of fear. You ever agreed to pay something because you were scared? And then you left and a little time went by and you got to thinking about it and you just wanted to kick yourself in the rear end just as hard as you could. Because you agreed to take on a bill that, that really wasn't authentic. It really wasn't just, you know. So, so, so Peter agrees. He just speaks for Jesus. Yes, he pays the temple tax. And then he comes back to Jesus and Jesus said, we're exempt from that. He says, but nevertheless, lest we offend him. He said, uh, we'll pay it, but, uh, but we ain't going to use our money. Hey. 
hear me in the prophetic. We'll pay it. But we ain't going to use our money. I'm waiting on somebody to catch what I'm throwing out. I said, we'll pay it. But we ain't going to use our money. I'm going to put an anointing on you, Peter. A heavenly divine enablement to go and get the money that you need for the taxing season you're going through without reaching into your own pocketbook. We'll pay it, but we just ain't going to use our money. So watch the miracle. It's cool. He says, number one, go to the sea. Every miracle, if you've learned anything from me, surely you've learned this. Every miracle, you got it, begins with an instruction. Research all through your Bible. If you need a miracle, you first need God to give an instruction. And so he says, go to the sea. Jesus, what does going to the sea have to do with paying the tax? You see... There is a miracle process that gives birth to an end of you having more than enough. But it begins with your obedience. It's the instruction that you choose to obey that determines the future you create. So he says, go to the sea. Here's the problem with miracles. You can't get them without doing what he said. Oh, I'm going to preach it a mission. Our problem is we rationalize the instruction to the point that we choke the faith needed to receive the miracle we're believing for. When God convicts you to do something, just do what he said. Because your miracle is waiting at the end of a process that begins when you obey. I said, your miracle is waiting at the end of a process that begins when you obey. I said, your miracle is waiting at the end of a process that begins when you obey. I said, your miracle is waiting at the end of a process that begins when you obey. So go to the sea. Cast <laughs> in a hook. Now, the hook is the mechanism that will catch what they're fishing for. Now, I want you to look at the parallels of this. There's a natural parallel, and there's a prophetic, a spiritual parallel. The sea represents the spirit world. Okay. You're standing on the natural if you're fishing, and you're casting a mechanism into another world, the aquatic world. It's a different world from the world of the land, governed by different properties and rules. So you're standing on the outside, and you need a mechanism while you're standing on the outside in the natural to reach down into the aquatic world if you want to pull something from the aquatic world up into the natural. Same thing with the spirit. You're standing in the natural realm, and you're fishing in the spirit, and you need a mechanism or a hook or a system that can go from where you are in the natural in down into another world and pull out the thing that you are believing for. So he said, Peter, you're going to have to go to the sea, but it's not just just going to jump out of the sea or jump out of the spirit into your life first you're going to have to cast in a mechanism that will help you grab what you need from where you are and pull it into your now moment now the problem is there's a lot of people fishing this morning but not everybody's got a hook Not everybody's got a faith mechanism, a praise mechanism, a belief mechanism, a prophetic mechanism, a seed mechanism. Not everybody's got something that they can throw out in the natural into the other world that will pull something back into their life. You got to have a hook. And they didn't use worms in Jesus' day. They didn't use what my grandpapa used, stink bait. They didn't use that stuff. You don't know nothing about stink bait. I saw the way you looked at me when I said it. What they would do is they would take a hook and they would polish it. 
make it real shiny. All you bass fishers know what I'm talking about. Bass fishers still don't use worms or stink bait. Bass fishers use reflectors, shiny objects, so that when the hook goes down into the darkness of the water, it'll catch and reflect the light. And the fish will be drawn and attracted to the light and bite the hook. The problem is what you're using to fish for is rusty. It's dirty. It's filthy. And if when you cast your hook into the realm of the spirit, if it does not reflect the light of Jesus Christ, no miracles are going to be swimming by and interested and attracted to what you're fishing for. So first, before you throw it in, you got to polish your hook. And polishing your hook is painful. Polishing your hook is old school stuff like fasting and prayer. Not to make you holier than everybody else, but for the purpose of polishing. Polishing your hook looks like pushing back from the table, turning the TV off, getting into the floor alone with God, seeking his face, not for salvation, but for the purpose of polishing. Polishing your hook means stop texting that man and getting so excited about a response. Stop meeting up with that girl. It's for the purpose of polishing. Because filthy hooks don't catch fish. Go to the sea. Cast in a hook. How's your hook doing? How's your prayer life doing? How's your consecration doing? You know how long it's been since some of us went on a 30 day consecration? What's a 30 day consecration? Let me break this down. You're a three-part being. You are spirit, you are soul, and you are body, flesh. Whichever one you feed the most is going to be the strongest. It's going to be the most prevalent. It's going to have the most dominion in your everyday life. So if all you do is read and listen to podcasts and educate yourself, your body and your spirit will be weak, but your soul, your mind will be strong. If all you do is eat in the natural, but you don't do anything spiritual or anything soulish, your body will be big, fat, and strong, but your spirit and your soul will be useless. Okay. Anytime you deny two of them, the third gets stronger. I'm going to say it again. Anytime you deny, I know y'all won't stand on this. Anytime you deny two of them, the third gets stronger. So when you go on a consecration, you turn the television off. You take all reading material except for the Bible out of your eyes. You don't listen to nothing, think about nothing, do nothing, but put his word in front of you. You push your plate back. You say, I'm fasting right now. You tell the body no. You tell the soul no. And you tell the spirit. Yes! Whatever it's got to take to get closer. Whatever it's got to take to get stronger. Whatever it's got to take to be near you, God. Cut it away from me. Polish it off of me. But the problem with it is, we like all the things about us that God wants to polish off. We like playing with our toys too much. And see, other church religions have made this a salvation issue. It's not a salvation issue. The salvation issue is this. Jesus died on the cross for those that believe in him. And when you believe it, that settles it. But that's just salvation. That don't do nothing for your hook. It don't do nothing for your grabber. It don't do nothing for your ability to stand in the natural and throw something out in the spirit and reel back a miracle. You need to sharpen and polish your hook. He said, go to the sea, cast in a hook, and then, what's it say? Take up the fish that comes up first. Now, when he says take the fish that comes up first, he's telling him that more than one fish is going to come. That, that. That the one he takes up first will have something for him, but there's 
There's multiple things there. But then when you study this in the Greek, oh, it's crazy. Chase, when you study this in the Greek, there's a lot of words for, for fish he could have used. But he uses the Greek word ektus. Ektus. You know what an ektus is. It's that little fish you see on the back of people's car that are Christians. He says, go to the sea, cast in a hook, and take up the first ectus that comes. Now, there's a prophetic vein here that Jesus is teaching. Because the word ectus doesn't just mean fish. It means to flop. It means to vibrate. It means to flutter. And the fourth definition in the Greek is to adore. So what he's saying is go to the sea, cast in a hook, and take up a praise. In other words, when you're going fishing in the spirit world, the first thing you have to catch is a praise. If you want to pull anything back from God, the first thing you have to pull up is a praise. Now, praise is spiritual. So when you go to the spirit world seeking products, the first product you can bring is out of your own spirit, which is a praise to God. And praise is spirit-to-spirit communication. When you begin giving God praise, it activates a river of living water. When you begin to give God praise, it stirs something up in the spirit realm. When you begin to give God praise... I don't know how to tell you this, but it's weird. If we were using the analogy of fish, okay, when you praise, you build a river around yourself that the spirit world feels with miracles like fish. And when you praise, when you pull up the praise out of your spirit, you've just put yourself down in the water. You know, the, there's fishermen that fish outside on the bank. But then there's those other crazy fishermen that put those waterproof pants on and they go out into the water. And they're a lot more successful because they are one with the world that they're fishing from. And so when you begin to give God praise, I'm preaching better than you're shouting. I said when you begin to give God praise, you become one with the world that you are fishing from. And when you catch a praise first, there's other fish to follow. There's other miracles to follow. There's other power to follow. There's other demonstration to follow. When you catch a praise first, then he says, y'all don't want to preach with me today. Then he says, he says, take the fish, Ectus, that comes up first. And when you have opened his mouth, Pastor John, is he talking about a fish or is he talking about Peter? Go to the sea. Sea represents the spirit world. Cast in a hook. Take up a praise. Is he talking about fishing or is he talking about worship? Is he talking about fishing or is he talking about Christian living? Go to the sea. Because it's a journey to get there. You don't live there every day of your life. You have to go to the sea. Remember that message I preached this year? You have to make the ascent. Go to the water. Cast in your mechanism. Your grabber. Everybody just do this with me. Just your, 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 your grabber. Cast in your hook. Take up a praise. Have you been doing that? Have you been praising? You do know that praise is not an emotional, soulish thing. Praise is something you do by faith, and it is a spiritual thing. That means sometimes you praise when you feel inspired to, and sometimes you praise because you simply know he's worthy. Sometimes it's something that you pull up or that you pull on to yourself like a jacket. That praise is comely for the upright. That praise attracts things to you. That praise is that reflective image that will cause what you are believing for to start swimming towards you. Have you done it yet this morning? Have you reached down out of your spirit by faith and dug far enough to give God a real substantive faith-based praise because you know he's worthy he said and when you have opened oh he said its mouth when you have opened its mouth 
Everything in the world's in your mouth. Did you know that? Everything in the world. Prove that, preacher. Okay. The power of life and death. Closed mouths don't get blessings from God. Ooh, Jesus. Closed mouths in the natural don't get fed. God ain't got a tube he can hook up to your stomach. You got to open your mouth. He said, open its mouth and you will find. Now, I wondered about this when I read the text. Normally, y'all are rowdy and talk back to me when I'm reading my text. Today, Lionel and Rebecca were talking to me. Everybody else was quiet. One of two things. Either you didn't have your coffee this morning, or you're a little uncomfortable with the fact and the idea that God can just give you money. <laughs> Sit there and look at me with your skeptical self while I preach the word of God. You're looking at me like God doesn't still have a fish. If only three of you get it, I'm happy for you. Because see, that's the thing. That weirdness that you feel here right now. That's the force of many people's doubt colliding with a few people's faith. Now, it makes no difference to me. I'm just the mailman. I got one person. I said I got one person taking that. I got one person that's got stuff swimming by him and has the faith to say, wait a second, give me that, give me that, give me that. I got one person. He said, go to the sea, cast in a hook, take up the praise first, open its mouth. See, praise can only work when you give a voice to it. Woo! Woo! Open its mouth, and down, down in there, you'll find a piece of money. Take that. Go and pay your taxes and mine. Now, there's five or six takeaway points that I want to share with you, and I'll be out of your way so you can go eat. Six takeaway points. Six take away. Tell somebody, take that. Ooh, I can't wait to go preach this message at a church that wants to receive it. <laughs> This is going to be a barn burner somewhere else. Number one, God cares about what's taxing you. And he wants to take care of it. Number two, taxing seasons come to distract you from your purpose. It's just a distraction. Number three, refuse to pay taxes. You're exempt from. Number four, for every unauthorized tax in your life, God still has a fish. Number five, the miracle came out of Peter's natural vocation, his job. God is about to move supernaturally in your natural job. Think about it. Think about it for a second. What was Peter's job? So fishermen, there was a lot of fishermen in that day. You know, being a fisherman was like, you know, equivalent to working at a fast food restaurant or something like that. It was just a very normal job. Jesus doesn't send Peter to go be an architect and build a building and find gold underneath a stone. 
He sends him back to what his normal, natural vocation was and said, I'm going to bless you in something that you do naturally. Meaning, I don't have to move you to Dubai and give you a job for the king or the prince in order for me to elevate your life financially. I can bless you right where you're at. I can bless your natural job and natural vocation to the point that you are accelerated and have more than you were expecting. I can bless you right where you're at. Think about it again in the context, knowing that Peter was a fisherman. He said, go to your job. Go get your natural tools. Okay? And just go do what you do. But while you're doing what you do, I'm putting something extra in the mouth of the thing you already do for a living so that when you take it up, it's double. Now, I ain't going to work too hard on you because if you ain't pulling, I ain't pushing. I ain't going to work too hard on you. No, you ain't, you, ain't, you ain't pulled on me today. That's your fault. But, but think about it. You watch Deadliest Catch again, you remember? They get paid for what they pull out of the ocean. So did Peter. Just Peter going and catching fish means he's going to get paid. But catching this fish that God sent means he's going to get paid double and extra and for somebody in here it's not that God's gonna move you to a different place God's gonna keep you in the same place doing what you're good at but all of a sudden you've been doing the same work doing the same labor going through the same routine but when you pull it up this time it is going to be doubled somebody shout double Isaiah 61, for your shame, you will receive double. Okay. For your shame, you will receive double. For that taxing season, you will receive. Double from what you already do. Ooh. Ooh. Double, double for the normal. It was, as, it was as normal for Peter to go catch a fish as it was for somebody to flip a hamburger. Yeah, Derek, double for your normal. Just double. Double. Just double. Just, just I did what I normally do. And I pulled up that fish. I mean, I pulled out my check. I pulled up that fish. I mean, I pulled out my check. And I pulled up that fish. I pulled out my check from the envelope that I normally get every two weeks. I pulled up that fish. I mean, I pulled out my check. But when I opened it, Not only did I get the fish, the check, but there was something in his mouth. God's about to put a little something extra. Woo. In the mouth of your normal. In the mouth of your everyday. In the mouth of your routine. Just You're going to look and say, what? Stand to your feet, give the Lord a praise. <laughs> Some stuff swimming all by you right now. Just swimming. Take that. Take that. Just take that. I prophesy raises and bonuses unexpectedly. Take that. 
I prophesy new opportunities that you don't qualify for, that you didn't work for, that you didn't position yourself for. There have been people that have been positioning themselves for 20 years for jobs. God's just going to give you, take, take that. And for those of you who have been up under unnecessary taxing seasons, taxing problems, taxing issues in relationships, in sickness, in marriage with children, taxing things are going to be removed in this season by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I want the elders and Pastor Merritt to come across all sides of the pulpit. If you've been up under, everybody bow your head, close your eyes. You've been, you're like in the middle of a taxing trial, just a serious problem issue. You walked in here carrying the load, the weight, and the care of that. Come down here real quick. We're going to pray with you. We're going to pray with you. Come down here real quick. It ain't no shame in it. It ain't no shame in it. It's a beautiful thing. Come down. Come down. Come down. Amen. Come down. Amen. Amen. 